yesterday, we discussed the situation at the end of the Battle of Kurukshetra. A personal devastation felt by Yudhisthira Maharaj. And we discussed yesterday how by Krishna's arrangement, not even Krishna could pacify Yudhisthira. Or Vyasadeva. Yudhisthira blamed himself for all the deaths and havoc caused by the war. He was certain he had acted selfishly. He was certain that he didn't have enough lifetimes to perform pious activities to counteract the sinful activities. We discussed yesterday how Yudhisthira's attitude is a model for us in terms of introspection and examining our motives, examining our activities. Yudhisthira was so frank and honest in his self-appraisal, so humble. He didn't blame anyone except himself. So now, the Adbhuta Karmana, Krishna, the performer of wondrous activities, is going to orchestrate the Pandavas, and especially Yudhisthira, going to see Bhishmadeva. Now, what kind of situation is Bhishmadeva in? <laughs> From the material point of view, you would look at Bhishma Dave on his deathbed and think, who wants to take advice from him? Look at his material situation. Yes, he's the greatest warrior. <clears throat> he's practically on the level of a demigod. But look at him now. His body pierced with arrows from head to toe. We're going to take advice from him? So you see, Right there, Srimad Bhagavatam is teaching you that the material situation is not of primary importance. Bhishma Dev is independent of his material body, so much so that he can leave his body. He can die when he wants to die. So if you become bewildered by the material external circumstances of Bhishma Dev, you'll miss the whole point. And in fact, a prominent theme of this section of Bhagavatam is that if you focus on the material externals of any of these situations we're discussing, you have missed the whole point. Mm -hmm. Queen Kunti, we discussed yesterday, she gives you a hint about that external mistake. She says, let calamities come again and again. I don't care. Because when the calamities are coming, Krishna is here to protect us. In other words, the real calamity is if Krishna leaves and goes back to Dwarka. So I don't care about the so-called calamities. She's teaching you a critical skill in bhakti yoga. She's teaching you that Don't simply look at the external packaging. Look at the contents. And then you'll be able to perceive the wealth of bhakti. Krishna wants to teach us that lesson. And he's teaching us through his dearest devotees. So much so that Krishna is willing to put his dearest devotees in such a state that they are bewildered and confused, just as Arjuna was in Bhagavad Gita, just as, Ar just as you, Yudhisthira Maharaj is now. This is Krishna's arrangement to create a teaching moment, a situation in which you can learn crucial lessons. And at the same time, while doing all that, 
Krishna is deepening the love between his devotees and him. All this is going on at once. But if we're so attached to the external circumstances and packaging, we'll miss the point completely. So this section of Bhagavatam is very challenging to our material attachments. We can become bewildered by the material circumstances and fail to see the extraordinary luxury and wealth of bhakti that is happening. And that's what Krishna wants you to focus your attention on. As you know, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has Arjuna declare it. Konteya pratijanihi nami bhakta pranashiti. Arjuna, declare it loudly, boldly, conclusively. My devotee will never be vanquished. That vanquish, never being vanquished, is referring to your real self and your real life. You as spirit soul in devotional service. The whole point of Bhagavad Gita is that anything material must be vanquished. So as long as we identify with the material body in the material world, we'll be vanquished. Bhutva, bhutva, paliyate, Krishna says. Everything material comes into being and goes out of being constantly. And Krishna in Bhagavad Gita tries to teach us that this material world is a place of suffering. Sometimes we have a hard time believing that, though. <laughs> we want to make it sukhalayam, a place of happiness. The th covering of illusion is so thick that because at this particular moment we may not be suffering, we think everything is fine. Just give us a few moments of not suffering and we think that is happiness. Krishna is introducing us to a different type of happiness, a different level of existence. But we're very attached to our illusions. I was thinking yesterday that these lessons Yudhisthira, Bhishma are giving us, they may sound very severe. I was wondering if Maybe it's too serious for devotees, although it is Srimad Bhagavatam. And as Sanatana Goswami says, every syllable of Srimad Bhagavatam is saturated with Krishna Prema. Still, I was thinking, <laughs> dealing with Yudhisthira Maharaj's agony at the end of the Battle of Kurukshetra, how he's Condemning himself. What have I done? This is all for my selfish purposes. Look at all the destruction this war has caused. As we said yesterday, indeed, everything that Arjuna was worried about in the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita, you could say it actually happened. <laughs> so many Families were destroyed because the men were killed in battle. Remember Arjuna said to Krishna, I don't see how any good can come if we fight this war. I only see reversals. I don't see any good fortune. Now at the end of the battle, you just steer is confirming what Arjuna was talking about more or less happened. And it's all because of me. I did this. Millions upon millions of soldiers are dead. Millions upon millions of families are without a husband, a father, a brother, all because I wanted to be king. It is not true, but he's such a humble and exemplary devotee that he's seeing in that way. 
So I was thinking yesterday, maybe this is too serious for our audience. <laughs> After all, you've been working hard, most of you all day, and you probably want some entertainment, yes? <laughs> <laughs> You come to the program here. All right, how is Maharaj going to be more entertaining than if we stayed at home and watched television <laughs> with the remote in the hand? <laughs> there is nothing that comes anywhere near <clears throat> hearing Srimad Bhagavatam as a means for rejuvenation, relaxation, stimulation, Fascination. Srimad Bhagavatam is the literary presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So I was thinking like that, but then today I talked to quite a few devotees who were telling me about their circumstances. Remember this section of Bhagavatam is about circumstances that are so in unsolvable and so perplexing that these circumstances pin you to the wall and pin you to the floor. So I talked to quite a few devotees today who were saying Hell, they have health problems they can't solve or they have employment problems. Their company that they work for was liquidated or, uh, or they have Permanent residency problems. <laughs> You're laughing, but some of these devotees, they're so terrified. If I don't pass the language test, I don't get the PR. I have to go back to the middle of nowhere in India. There'll be no devotees around. They're really in anxiety, shaking with anxiety. I have been in Australia seven years. I've been with the devotees. If, if I don't get this permanent residency, what will become of me? What will happen to my spiritual life? I have to go out into the middle of nowhere. Or I have no job now here and my relatives in India, they're sick. The father is ill, and I have to make more money. What to do? Well, I was hearing this all today. So then I thought, it is not too much for you to hear about Yudhisthira's situation and Bhishma's response. <laughs> because everyone is caught in their drama of circumstances. If not today, then tomorrow. I told you yesterday about this woman from Argentina who, after she was married and had children, she found out that the man she thought was her father, who raised her so lovingly, actually killed her real mother and father and then adopted her. What would you do in those circumstances? Those of you who were here yesterday, you heard that. She, rep she, she, she repudiated the one she thought was her father, the only father she had known. She never saw her original parents. Her father killed her original parents as a military man, remember, because the parents were political protesters. And then he took this baby as his own. And so she only knew him. And then when she's 26 with her own children, she finds out he's not my father. In fact, he killed my original, my real mother and father, torturing them and then killing them in the name of state security. How would you handle that? And what about the children who were calling this man grandfather? What would you do? So in our own way, circumstances come upon us that sometimes are so perplexing. 
It may not be that precise situation, but from time to time, everyone faces severe circumstances happening to you or happening to someone dear to you. I told the story yesterday about the lady at the beach with her children who texted her husband who was on a business trip in San Francisco. This is paradise. The beach is so wonderful today. Oh, we're like in heaven. And a half hour later, she's dead. I also remembered the reaction of the wife of one of the passengers on the Malaysian Airlines plane that disappeared into the ocean. Hundreds of persons gone. She was a New Zealander living in Perth. And her husband took that flight. He was going from Perth to Kuala Lumpur where, and then to Beijing where he would get another flight to Mongolia because there was his dream, a uh, financially lucrative job in Mongolia as a mechanical engineer. He would, the idea was he would go there for 28 days, make big money, then come back home to Perth. So he was on that flight that disappeared. Right before he boarded the flight, he sent a text message to his wife. You and the children mean the world to me. And then he gets on the flight, and the flight just disappears. He left behind a wife and a three-year-old son and an 11-month-old son. The mother described she had her three-year-old son with her, and she just started crying. She doesn't know how to explain to him. And he's pulling on her arm, mother, mother, what's wrong? What's wrong? And what can she say to a three-year-old child? She said, daddy is lost. Daddy is lost. And he looks at his mother in her eyes and says, don't worry, mother. I'll go find him. And then the mother describes that her three-year-old son is seeing her crying day after day. And he's asking her, where, where is daddy? Where is daddy now? And the mother still didn't know what to say. She asked her son, her three-year-old son, where's your heart? And of course he pointed, here's my heart, mother. Daddy is in your heart. These situations are real life. That's why in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Srila Prabhupada explains that actually everyone has their own personal Kurukshetra war. Some situation that is unsolvable Even if you can say, due to karmic arrangement, you sailed through this lifetime without any major problems, still, you do have the major problem. You have a material body. <laughs> That's what Krishna alerts you to in Bhagavad Gita. You have taken birth. You are subject to old age and disease, and you're and this body will die. That is the main problem, no matter the flow of temporary happiness and distress. So Krishna is doing us such a favor by pointing out what is the real situation. But we like to hide from reality.
So now the Pandavas, along with Krishna himself, they've gone to where Bhishma Dev is about to leave this world. We described yesterday about how Bhishma Dev's departure scene is a universal event. All the elite personalities from the whole universe have gathered there. The greatest sages, including Shukadev Goswami. These sages were not only from the earth, but from higher planets. But everyone wanted to be there for Bhishma Dev's departure because he was such an extraordinary personality. So Krishna chose this scenario for relieving Yudhisthira of his self-persecution. You see, the question is, did Yudhisthira Maharaj lose his judgment by becoming involved in the battle of Kurukshetra? Or did he lose his judgment another way? Not in the battle, but did he lose his judgment in his self-evaluation of his role in the battle. And yes, the second one is true. Yudhisthira lost his judgment in terms of self-appraisal, self-evaluation about his role in the battle of Kurukshetra. But that loss is by Krishna's arrangement. Just as Arjuna lost his power of discrimination in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita by Krishna's arrangement. So just see how Krishna is using what we would consider to be catastrophes as a means to instruct all who will listen. And by Krishna instructing in this way, we stop taking material happiness and distress so seriously. We stop taking it as the be all and end all of existence. So let us go to where Bhishma Dev is filled with arrows and he's about to leave. As he sees the Pandavas bowing down before him and Krishna also bowed down because Krishna is having his Naralila, his human-like pastimes. So he bows down to Bhishma Dev as if <laughs> He's Bhishma Dave's junior. First, you should understand Bhishma Dave's affection, his outpouring of affection, that is, for the Pandavas. He's seeing them, his beloved Pandavas, in their rightful place, regaining the throne. This satisfies Bhishma Dev, you could say unlimitedly, even though Bhishma Dev fought against them. Why? Circumstances. Again, another lesson, how this world can put you in such excruciating, painful situations, but you have no other choice. Bhishma Dev knew that Duryodhana's side was wrong but as a Chatriya, he also knew I maintained by Duryodhana's side. So therefore, he had to fight against his beloved Pandavas, fight against Krishna. This is what circumstances can do to us in life. We should let this situation that we're hearing about enter deep into our heart. Something like that has happened to us. Something like that will happen to us. Circumstances catch you. Now Bhishma Dev is about to leave this world and he's seeing that his beloved Pandavas 
are victorious. The ills, the injustices have been corrected. He's so satisfied. Tears are flowing from his eyes. Have you ever been so happy for someone else? For someone else's good fortune that tears flow from your eyes? I don't know what kind of situations you've been in when that happened. Maybe some good fortune happened to a family member and you were so happy for them, you cried. Or maybe one of your family members became relieved from a life-threatening situation and you were so happy that you cried. Now just remember, Bhishma Dev is the greatest warrior. <laughs> so when he cries, this is extraordinary. As ladies know very well, men, they don't like to cry. <laughs> and ladies cry all the time. <laughs> Actually, men are emotional, but they just don't show it. So here you have the greatest warrior, and he's freely crying. So happy that the Pandavas have regained their throne. So now, Bhishma Dev has to deal with Yudhisthira, who is persecuting himself so uh, intensely. You remember Yudhisthira saying, what kind of hell awaits me? Look how I've ruined society. Look at the devastation that I've caused just for my own selfish purposes. Actually, it's not true. The battle of Kukshetra was by the will of Krishna. And it is also the will of Krishna that Yudhisthira becomes king. So then you have to think, who is this Krishna who's manipulating like this? If you are antagonistic to Krishna or atheistic, you would protest. What gives Krishna the right to orchestrate all these things? He should mind his own business. <laughs> Just like atheists will argue when you say that you know that there is God because you've had a spiritual experience, a mystical experience. Do you know what atheists will say? First of all, there's nothing supernatural. There's nothing so-called spiritual. But even if there is, which there's not, how do you know that your spiritual experience shows that there is a God behind everything? Maybe your spiritual experience, whatever you want to call it, simply shows that there's some kind of committee <laughs> that's giving these spiritual experiences. Maybe your individual spiritual experience is showing that the world's run by a committee, the universe is run by a committee, and sometimes the committee gets it right and sometimes it gets it wrong. <laughs> of course, we take our stand on Shastra. Krishna says, Aham sarva se prabhavo, matta sarvam pravartate. I am the origin of everything material and spiritual. Everything emanates from me. And then Krishna proceeds to give you the process by which you can verify him as the cause of all causes. So we may be just beginning in that process, but still the process is there. And as you progress on the road back to Krishna, you always get confirmation. So you're reading, and by applying what you read in your daily life, you get confirmation. And the most amazing confirmations are 
when you've gone through some ordeal, some difficult situation. And that's what Krishna is going to show you in this pastime with Bhishwadeva and the Pandavas. So-called difficulties actually bring the luxury of deeper attachment for Krishna. That's why Kunti says, they're not calamities that have been happening. They brought me Krishna, so let's have more of those so-called calamities. <laughs> I know it sounds a little scary, right? <laughs> I remember I was in uh, a former Czechoslovakia around 1978 in Prague and underground days of Krishna Conscious Society because it's the communist regime and especially former Czechoslovakia was very difficult because they had their uprising in 1968 and so They were guarded very tightly, so to speak. So they would not leave the Soviet empire. So we were having an initiation ceremony there. Uh, and there wasn't anyone from Czechoslovakia at the initiation ceremony, but they had come from other countries, Bulgaria, Poland, Hungary. And so the devotee who was giving the initiation, he asked me to pick out a verse for the lecture. So <laughs> I picked out the verse by Queen Kunti Devi, let these miseries, calamities happen again and again. <laughs> <laughs> so the devotee giving the initiation said, oh, no, no, we don't want to scare all the initiates away. <laughs> we better find another verse. <laughs> because, you know, they didn't know so much about bhakti. And foremost in their mind was, of course, I want relief from the miseries of living in this communist regime. And then second to that, they wanted wisdom and knowledge. Still by hearing about Kunti Devi's way of analyzing things, our bhakti increases. So at first we may feel a little intimidated. What have I got myself into? What, praying, let these calamities come again and again? <laughs> but she's pointing out what is real wealth, what is real luxury. And the more we advance in bhakti, the more we can appreciate what is that real luxury, what is that real wealth. But unless we have experience, some experience of that real luxury and wealth, we'll be very apprehensive. Ooh, let these calamities come again and again. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so again, Krishna is turning us upside down and getting us to relinquish our grip on the externals as the source of prosperity. So now we're back to Bhishma Dave, crying tears of joy. But look at Bhishma Dave's situation. Why does he think of himself? He's shot through and through, head to toe with arrows. He's about to die by his own choice. He has the power to die only when he wants to. Still, he's dying head to toe filled with arrows. And he's crying with joy to see the Pandavas regaining their rightful kingdom. What's going on here? This whole section of Bhagavatam should make you think. <clears throat> now, remember, Yudhisthira is overwhelmed with grief and self-condemnation. Bhishmadeva is going to skillfully focus Yudhisthira's attention away from himself and onto, away from Yudhisthira's so-called role in causing the battle of Kurukshetra. 
Beach Bay is going to focus that attention on the sufferings that the Pandavas went through. In other words, Bhishmadev, he's very tactful. He's a chatriya. So he's going to say, you're so worried about the havoc that supposedly you caused for others. What about the havoc that you and your brothers went through? What about the suffering you and your brothers and your mother went through? Now, when Bhishmadev says that, one has to take it seriously. You can't just brush it off. Hmm. Bhishmadev explains, he exclaims with emphasis, Aho kashtam, aho nyayam. Oh, what danger and suffering. Aho kashtam. Oh, what injustice you all incurred. Immediately all talk about Yudhisthira condemning himself stops. And Yudhisthira has, excuse me, Bhishmadev has switched the spotlight onto the Pandavas themselves. Look at all you went through. Look at the horrors that happened to you. So he says, Aho kashtam aho nyayam yad yuyam dharma nandana jivatam nahata kristam vipra dharma shutashraya. Oh, what terrible sufferings and what terrible injustices you good souls suffer for being the sons of religion personified. It's Dharma Nandana. You did not deserve to remain alive under those tribulations, yet you were protected by the Brahmanas, God, and religion. You shouldn't have lived. Those dangers were so excruciating, so extraordinary. You, sh you should all be dead. <laughs> This is Bhishmadev's power. He's refocused the whole scenario. Yudhisthira has given such powerful lamentations and condemnations, self-condemnations. But Bhishmadev, <laughs> with his power, has refocused the whole scene. You didn't deserve to live through the miseries you went through. And just think, you all are Dharma Nandana. You're the sons of religion personified. Oh, Kashtam, the suffering, the dangers you went through. Oh, Nyahayam, the injustices, it wasn't right. <laughs> you know how angry you get when there's injustice? <laughs> you hate to be cheated. You hate to be deprived wrongfully of what is your due. The working men know at the workplace. If you're passed over for promotion or someone, there's some politics at work and someone takes credit for things you've done, you know how angry you get, right? It's not fair. <laughs> hmm. Just think of the injustices that the Pandavas went through. That's what Bhishmadev wants you to think about. Misery, sufferings, dangers, injustice is so great that he says you, didn't, you, you shouldn't have survived. You should be dead. Mm -hmm. And you are Dharma Nandana. You're the sons of religion personified. And this is happening to you? So what are you going to say? Yeah. What's going on here? <laughs> They're Dharma Nandana, and look what happens. What kind of world is this? What's the point of their spiritual life? Maybe we should stop chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> if this is what happens to the Panch Pandava, <laughs> where's our protection? What does Krishna mean when he has Arjuna declare? 
Kauntiya Pratijani, now my Bhakta Pranashati. My devotee will never be vanquished. Bhishma Dev is saying the Pandavas should be dead. <laughs> Through all the circumstances they went through. Bhishma Dev also points out the Pandavas had protection. Because they were acting under the guidance of the Brahmanas, they were in harmony with the desires and plans of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And they were following Bra they were following Dharma, religious principles. That's what protected them. So in any situation in life, no matter how deadly and perplexing and overpowering, if we cling to those three things, the guidance from the Brahmana Vaishnavas, not the astrologers, <laughs> the Brahmana Vaishnavas who give advice based on Shastra, <laughs> and we're in harmony with Krishna, what Krishna wants, and we're following Dharma, religious principles, then we're safe no matter what kind of excruciating situation we're in. So this is what we want to reinforce in our life. This is the real wealth. Circumstances in our life can be so trying and testing. But Bishwade wants to declare it to us boldly that as if you've got those three things in your life, you're safe, you're wealthy, you're secure. Bodies will get sick. Money will come and go. Family members will die on us. <laughs> but if we have the guidance of the Brahmana Vaishnavas, the we, we have harmony with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and if we follow Dharma, we have the best of life, no matter what our situation, no matter what our circumstances. Misery is when you let the circumstances of the material world totally dominate you. That is misery. And sometimes I see this misery affects our devotees. They become disempowered. And what disempowers them? The illusory energy. You can't practice your spiritual life. You can't chant Hare Krishna. You have so many material problems that you have to deal with. And in order to deal with material problems, you have to focus upon them 100%. So put your beads aside. Be practical, right? You've got to focus on getting a job. You've got to focus on passing the English test. You can get PR. This is what you have to focus on. Because if you don't focus on these things 100%, you're finished. I don't, never mind which mantra you chant. If you don't focus on your material situation 100%, you'll fail. That's Maya disempowering you, stripping your spiritual nourishment away from you. You think this is the way to success, but actually you'll become so miserable because your life will simply be 100% dominated by external circumstances. I have to do this because of that. I have to do that because of this. And what about my spiritual life? It's gone. My life is just complete surrender to circumstances. That's misery. Your life is under the gun of circumstances completely. And but when that happens, what does Maya tell you? Just see. You're totally under the control of all these circumstances. 
And even though now you realize it, it's too late. So don't even bother to try to fix this. This is the cruelty of the illusory energy. You're pinned to the ground. And then Maya tells you, why even bother trying to get up? <laughs> it's hopeless. The illusory energy has two departments. One is the throwing department. When the illusory energy roars in your ear, what are you doing chanting Hare Krishna? What are you doing having this spiritual life? Just get out of there. <laughs> Drop this. This is the throwing potency of Maya. Sometimes, especially new devotees, but not only new devotees, they tell me. They wake up in the morning and they, why am I doing this? <laughs> Why am I practicing spiritual life? That's the throwing potency of Maya. What do you, who do you think you are? You're no sadhu. <laughs> what are you doing fingering those beads? <laughs> you have practical things you need to be focusing on. <laughs> Remember, time is money. The time you spend on your spiritual life you could be making money. <laughs> you could be getting that BMW. <laughs> Just think what your relatives will, how they'll think when they come to visit you from India and they see you driving a BMW. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the throwing potency of Maya. Just stop it. Just stop this. Get real. <laughs> and then there's the covering potency of Maya. Once she throws you out of your spiritual life, then she covers you over more and more so you, you, you can't see your way back. And even you realize you made a huge mistake, but you can't see the way back to regain your Krishna consciousness again. This is misery. When your whole life becomes circumstantial, dominated 100% by circumstances. So now Bhishma Dev is going to get you to see the material and spiritual advantages that the Pandavas had. Remember, he said, you didn't deserve to go through all what you went through. The injustice, the dangers, the suffering. You of all people, Dharma Nandana. And then, what about your mother, Kunti Devi? When did Kunti Devi's suffering end? As a young, Wife, she lost her husband, and she was left with five children to raise. But that wasn't the end. When her little children grew up, she still suffered through all the miseries that Duryodhana inflicted upon the Pandavas. When does Kunti Devi's suffering end? 
first you lose your husband and you've got little children, then the children grow up and they're growing up in such a ferocious environment where someone's constantly trying to kill them so they don't, so they don't become the monarchs. The mother has to see all this. So Bhishma Dev is pointing that out. Remember, he's refocused the whole situation. He's turned the spotlight away very dramatically from Eudistir's condemning himself for so-called, his so-called having started the war. Bhishma has switched that spotlight on all the sufferings that the Pandavas went through. So that's what we're focusing on right now. Look at what Kunti Devi went through. Then consider the advantages that the Pandavas had. They had material advantages in terms of power, brilliance, expertise. Also, they had spiritual advantages. Krishna is their friend. You have Yudhisthira, who's Dharma Sutta, the son of religion personified. You have Arjuna the expert fighter with the Gandiva bow. You have Bhima, expert fighter with the club. And then, of course, you could add, there's Draupadi, who's practically Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. The Pandavas had all these assets going for them. And yet, they went through such ordeals. This was Bhishma Day's point. So how is it that this happened? What's going on? What's the explanation? Was it their karma? Who are you going to blame? What are you going to blame? How does Bhishma Dev explain it? Because remember, Krishna has brought everyone to Bhishma Dev. They wouldn't listen to Krishna by Krishna's arrangement. <laughs> because Krishna wanted to glorify Bhishma Dev as being the fount of all wisdom and knowledge. Although actually everything's coming from Krishna, but Krishna wants to give the glory to his devotee. So what is Bhishma Dev's analysis? Sarvam kala kritam manye. I think, I consider, all these events are caused by time. Time? How can you blame time? but we're getting an education now as to what actually brings things about in the material world. In my opinion, this is all due to inevitable time under whose control everyone in every planet is carried, just as the clouds are carried by the wind. So he'll explain more about this time factor that he's saying is the actual cause of the Pandavas' ordeals, tribulations. Because normally you would think, I went through such a situation, such a uh, trying situation because of karma. But the Pandavas don't have karma. <laughs> and actually, devotees Strictly speaking, don't have karma also. When a devotee goes through a particular ordeal, it's not actually karma. Lord Brahma explains that. Karmani nidahati kinju bhakti bhajam. What a devotee experiences is a, a special package personally supervised by Krishna. Minimize karma. Minimize karmic reaction. It's not given by the laws of material nature. It's given personally by Krishna. So much so that as Prabhupada would famously explain, if you cut your finger 
As a devotee, you should know that normally, under the laws of karma, you should have lost your head. So even for the so-called ordinary devotee, there's no ordinary devotee, every devotee is extraordinary, but even regarding the devotees we see around us, if they are properly following the bhakti process, following the regular principles, chanting Hare Krishna, they're not getting karma like an ordinary person gets karma. The so-called troubles of devotees are a special personal blend given by Krishna that has been, and that special blend has been personally put together by Krishna. It's a token, it's a tiny amount of what we actually do. And in this way, we lose whatever enthusiasm we have for the material world. <laughs> That's mercy from Krishna. So in the purport, Prabhupada writes, <clears throat> one should not be disturbed by the tricks of eternal time. Even the great controller of the universe, Brahmaji, is also under the control of that time. Therefore, one should not grudge being thus controlled by time, despite being a true follower of religious principles. So this is the point. Did Yudhisthira commit sinful activities in a previous life and now he's suffering? No. There's no karma. No recent karma, no old karma. So then what's going on? Bhishma says, it's time that's causing these things. But then someone would say, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakura points this out, someone could say, but isn't time just the underlying bed which contains happiness and distress? And isn't happiness and distress karma-driven? So still, you may say that time is causing things, but isn't time all about bringing karmic reactions? But Bishwadeva is saying, no. For you to steer, it is not karma. It is simply the movement of time without any added factor of happiness and distress as a karmic reaction. This is very mysterious. Think about it. Time bringing events which have nothing to do with karma. Think again. Karma means that time is bringing happiness and distress in the form of karmic reactions. But Bhishmadev is saying, in this case, for Yudhisthira and the Pandavas, it's time bringing events, and that movement of time has nothing to do with karma, the flow of happiness and distress. So what then is, what's time doing? And why? Before pointing out what time is actually doing and why, Bhishma Dave glorifies the time factor. Oh, how wonderful is the influence of inevitable time. It is irreversible. Otherwise, how can there be reverses among such glorious personalities as the Pandavas? The Pandavas had all material and spiritual resources, yet they went through such experiences They had all piety, all dharma, yet these calamities befell them. So what Bhishma Dev is saying is, time brought these situations to the Pandavas, not karma. 
He stripped away the karmic aspects of how time normally operates, bringing us happiness and distress as a karmic reaction. And Bhishma Dev is saying, it's just time in of itself, which is another way of saying what? It is Krishna. Because time is identical with Krishna. In Bhagavad Gita, he says, Kalosmi, I am time. So this is Bhishma Dev's way of saying, you see, there's nothing to lament. This is all beyond us. The time factor is causing all these things. And that flow of the time factor indicates the will of Krishna. In other words, the effects that time has produced resemble karma, but actually it's not karma. A subtle point, but important, because since when are members of Krishna's entourage, his associates, since when are they subject to time in terms of karma? The opulences of a devotee are never destroyed by time. So then what's time doing? If time actually cannot destroy the opulences of devotees, their spiritual opulences, what is time doing? Time is enhancing the bhakti of the devotees by bringing situations that increase their loving relationship with Krishna. So now Bhishma Dev focuses on Krishna. First he said time, and then he points out time is identical with Krishna. You can't understand what's going on because these movements of time are actually the movements of Krishna. And who can understand what Krishna does? He says to Yudhisthira, O king, no one can know the plan of the Lord, even though great philosophers inquire exhaustively, they're still bewildered. Krishna was using the Pandavas, his dear devotees, to teach lessons to us all. To show us the triumph of bhakti. There is no way that the Pandavas were under the influence of the material energy and suffering. It's a drama staged by Krishna so that we can see what is real wealth, what is real luxury. Can you say that Krishna wants to give you s misery? No, he's affectionate to his devotees. Can you say that Krishna wants to give his devotee material happiness? From the spiritual point of view, there's no such thing as material happiness. <laughs> so what is Krishna doing? He is increasing the love of his devotees. That should make you wonder, what kind of love is this? <laughs> Everyone says they want love, and Krishna is teaching you what is love. We have to be humble and admit, we don't really know what love is. Our vision of love is based on the bodily conception of life. So now Bishmadev concludes, I maintain, he says, he's talking to Yudhisthira, Bharata Rishabha, he calls him, best among the descendants of Bharata. I maintain, therefore, that all these things that have happened are within the plan of Krishna. You should accept that plan and do what? You must follow the plan 
by becoming king because that is what Krishna wants. And then Bhishma Dev focuses Yudhisthira's attention on the helpless plight of the citizens. So you have to take charge to help them. So in this way, we get a real education in how to see situations as a devotee. After Bhishma Dev explains the inconceivable plan of Krishna in its form of time and time's movements, he then says, do you understand what's happening amongst us? In other words, it's not simply the inconceivable movements of the time factor. Look what's going on right amongst us. You have Bhagavan Sri Krishna, who is acting like an ordinary person, bewildering everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Bhishma Dev is explaining all this. There's time, which is identical with the will of Krishna. That's bewildering us. We can't figure out the movements of time. But then look, the person you call your friend, your messenger, <laughs> your relative. Do you know who he is? <laughs> He's bewildering everyone. <laughs> He's moving amongst us. He's moving amongst the Vrishni Vamsha, the Vrishni dynasty, just like he's a normal human being. And with his own self-created energy, he's bewildering all of us. <laughs> so then, you might ask, well, if it's so that time is so bewildering with its movements, and time indicates the will of Krishna, and now you say that amongst you all there is Krishna acting like a human being, why don't you just ask Krishna what's going on? What's the answer to that? Bhishmadeva is implying that even though Krishna is walking amongst us, he bewilders us. <laughs> We can't figure it all out. That's why in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Avajananti Mamuda. Fools think that I'm an ordinary human being just because I'm appearing within human society. After this thorough explanation, Bhishma Dev prepares to leave this world by focusing his consciousness on Krishna. He gives Yudhisthira instructions how to rule the kingdom. And Yudhisthira accepts his kingdom back. And Bhishma Dev departs this world. All right, any questions? Yes. Thank you, Maharaj, for an enlightening class. Uh, Maharaj, you mentioned that um, it's on one hand there is karma, on one hand there is the influence of time, which mm -hmm. is given personally given by Krishna. Um, now the Pandavas, we understand, were pure devotees, fully surrendered mm -hmm. to the Lord, but but for conditioned souls who are trying to be Vaishnavas, like myself, or like Vaishnava Bhas, we are called. So how do we understand that something which comes misery in our life is, is given personally by Krishna? That means, are we certifying ourselves as Vaishnavas, if we think like that? We accept what the Shastra says, which is that it is a special blend of karma. And the Acharyas instruct us to think that we deserve much worse, but Krishna has kindly minimized it. So because the Acharyas have instructed that we think like that, we do. 
At the same time, out of devotional humility, a devotee will pray, as Srila Prabhupada wrote in his famous Vyasa Puja offering to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sahasri Thakur. Let me suffer for all the cause of births that I'm due to suffer because of my sinful activities, but let me only have this one thing, this remembrance that I am just the humble servant of his divine grace. I bow down at his feet with all the humility at my command. This is the bhakti bhava, the emotions of a devotee. Yes, Krishna has kindly minimized my karmic reactions. That is Krishna's mercy. I deserve much worse, no matter what happens. That's how the acharyas instruct us to think. It is not pride to think as the acharyas ask us to think. Naturally, we don't think we're much of a devotee. Nevertheless, if we're doing the basics in bhakti, we know it. <laughs> and we can expect that whatever distresses we all must go through in this world, we, we can expect that Krishna has a hand in it. So the acharyas instruct us to see in that way. And that we should not be angry. I'm practicing spiritual life. How can Krishna do this to me? That's what they're instructing us not to be like. How could this happen to me? I have done so much service. That attitude is generally the problem. Anything else? Well, Maharaj, it's just an extension of uh, Prabhu's question. So I noticed that uh, the word karma is used quite loosely among devotees. Isn't that kind of... Uh, I mean, at least I would feel, is it a kind of discouraging in that case, or? What exactly are you meaning? As in, uh, as in literally assuming that it's all our karma, basically, isn't that? Unless you give a specific instance, it's hard for me to understand what you mean. Yeah, well, it's like it's any kind of a miserable situation that might have come upon us. and. Bhakti requires guidance. So <laughs> sometimes devotees do something foolish and then they say, oh, it was all my karma. <laughs> when actually it's their own foolishness. That's why bhakti requires guidance. You need superior advice to tell you. <laughs> you fell asleep at the wheel while driving and you crashed, it's all your own negligence. Remember, Bhishma Dev told Yudhisthira, you are guided by three things, the Brahmana Vaishnavas, the harmony with the Supreme Personality Godhead, and Dharma. Therefore, you shouldn't feel that you went off course during all these events, that you brought, you acted unjustly. You shouldn't think that way. Look at, look at the guidance you're getting. Look at the, in, you had the three main influences. So why can't our own devotees here have those three main influences? Mm -hmm. And then you won't just cheaply say, it's all my karma. 
when it's actually due to your negligence? Nevertheless, there will be situations in which just come out of nowhere upon our devotees, setbacks, and with guidance they can see. Krishna is so kind upon me. I deserve much worse. But Krishna has kindly given me a personal blend. It's actually not regular karma. It's a personal blend given by Krishna, which is so reduced. Now, of course, we're always thinking, you call this reduced? <laughs> <laughs> We're always complaining about something. <laughs> we don't know the full extent of the bad things we've done in previous lifetimes. And therefore we think, what have I done to deserve this happening to me? I have family problems, marriage problems, parenting problems, health problems, financial problems. What have I done to deserve all this? We don't see it. In any case, Bhagavatam is teaching us how a devotee can triumph in all circumstances. We have to face the facts. This material world is not our home. It is not a place conducive for real prosperity and happiness. We have to face that fact. And then if we face that fact, we won't be angry at Krishna for utilizing material circumstances to bring us closer to him. What better purpose could the material world serve <laughs> than to be utilized by Krishna to, to deepen our love for Krishna? But we're thinking, I know a lot of other things the material world could do for me. <laughs> more money, more luxury, more social respect. But just see, for the devotee, Krishna is using his material energy to bring you closer to him. And we're complaining. This is how kripana, how miserly we are. Anything else? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the very nice class. Uh, in the beginning, we were discussing about Yudhishthir Maharaj and uh, how humble and tolerant he was by giving all, uh, means he was, he was not taking all the blame on himself for whatever happened. So as practicing devotees, how do we develop such a mood of humility and tolerance and always um, look for the good in others and take the blame on ourselves for anything? In material life, Whenever something goes wrong, you always try to find someone to blame. And if you got money, the first thing you do is hire a lawyer to blame someone else. <laughs> <laughs> That's material life. <laughs> In spiritual life, we want to understand how even it may seem that we didn't directly do anything wrong to someone, we're thinking, I must have some defect in my consciousness which influenced that other person to act in this way. The non-devotee way is to be always eager to blame someone else. Material life means who are you going to blame? You've got to be someone. Spiritual life means, as Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur said, the only reason why I can see a fault in you is because I have the same fault in me a thousand times more. Therefore, I am the world's expert in the fault. That's why I can see it in you. Completely different attitude. Yes? 
how do we understand that the material energy acts uh, kind of independent of Krishna? Because, uh, like, as we discussed, uh, the karma um, and um, the Krishna uh, brings uh, some events to our life, uh, like, separately. Nothing is independent of Krishna. Yes. So, how do we understand this? But Krishna has a prison house energy. That's the material energy. And reluctantly, he puts you under the control of that prison house energy. But it's his prison house energy. He says in Bhagavad Gita, Mamamaya Dharatya, my prison house energy, the material energy, is impossible to overcome unless you surrender to Krishna. So the material energy is not independent of Krishna, but it seems to act independent of Krishna. That's why it's called Maya. <laughs> it gives you the impression. It pollutes your consciousness so you think there's no connection of this material world to Krishna. And I can do what I like and I can enjoy as I like. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, just have some you know, conflict in my mind that uh, you know, how can we understand uh, the uh, Bhisma, Bhisma Dev's uh, lessons while Bhisma Dev himself was a uh, you know part of uh, Duryodhana's evil plan. So. How do we understand this? How do we, what was the first part? So the first part is like, you know, one side, Krishna Dev teaching this lessons to uh, Yudhisthir Maharaj, uh, you know, in Bhisma Parva. And other side, uh, Bhisma Pitama himself was a part of, uh, you know, evil plan of uh, Duryodhana. So he didn't say anything. So indirectly he was involved in that. So how do Krishna we wanted to show that even the greatest warrior can't win if Krishna doesn't want him to win. <laughs> also, by means of the battle of Kurukshetra, Bhishma Dev gave pleasure to Krishna through fighting. Remember when Bhishma Dev was shooting arrows at Krishna? Krishna was feeling those arrows to be the same as the kisses from his fiancée. That is God. <laughs> Bhishma Dev was filling Krishna with pleasure. <laughs> In the secondary rasa of chivalry, Krishna was feeling the so called wounds inflicted on his transcendental body by Bhishma Dev's arrows to be <laughs> equal to the kisses of his fiancees. You could never say that. <laughs> That's the difference between you and the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One difference. So Bhishma Dev, by his fighting with Krishna, is rendering devotional service. Yes. Why does Bish Bhishma Dev describe time as the cause and not just directly say Krishna is the cause? He's giving you a thorough education in terms of how things work in existence. Krishna has energies. So Bhishma Dev is teaching you to see the whole picture of how Krishna does things. You see, Krishna, what is Krishna's main activity? Do you know? You think he's like the creator who has his, literally has his hand stuck into every situation? I think he's the enjoyer. 
Exactly. Krishna's main activity is enjoying. So he has the time factor accomplishing so many things on his behalf. But the devotee knows that the time factor is actually Krishna's will. Yes? Can you explain the time concept a bit more because I'm having trouble understanding? Time is a, an energy of Krishna. Kala Shakti, it's an energy. And Krishna says he is that energy. He is that time. It's Krishna's way of getting things done. You could say, sort of, time is the invisible hand of Krishna. <laughs> okay? All right. <laughs> but when you go to Goloka Vrindavan, You'll find that Krishna has his hands on cows, he has his hands on his friends, he has his hands on his consorts, he has his hands on trees and plants in Vrindavan. But to help us in our seeing Krishna's presence and everything, you could say in the material world, the time is the hand of Krishna. But as you get more knowledge of how Krishna does things and what Krishna is doing, <laughs> you'll understand why he has a time factor that accomplishes things. Krishna doesn't even directly create. He doesn't directly maintain any living entities. He doesn't directly destroy anything. He offloads all that, so to speak, to expansions of expansions of expansions. I always explain, many of you know. Why is it that Krishna plays a flute? Do you know? I think I do. I think he plays his flute because he's enjoying and he's free because he's offloaded all of He's playing his flute to let you know he's all play and no work. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> he never works mm -hmm. for his enjoyment. Just the opposite of us. Right. <laughs> now you got it. <laughs> you are making great progress in your Krishna education. <laughs> so Bhishma Dave is pointing out to you to student the Pandavas. Look, we can't understand the time factor. We can't understand the inconceivable movements of time. But just think again. Look who's right amongst us. <laughs> we can't understand him, the origin of time. <laughs> so in other words, you just dear, get up on the throne and do your job. <laughs> 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 All right, let's end with some kirtan. <laughs>
throwing it to the CC money, she both give me out the strong your eyes over a body. Jai over swells of the body, Jai was throwing it to the CC money, both give me out the strong your eyes over a body. Jai over swells of the body, Jai was throwing it to the CC money, both give me out the strong your eyes over a body. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna.